1 Corinthians 1, and uh, let's read verses 17 and 18. Paul writes, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And when you see things like that, you want to pay attention. That indicates the gospel and baptism are two separate things. The gospel doesn't require baptism. It doesn't need water baptism as part of it. But to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the, preach for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it, the preaching, is the power of God. Also look at verses, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. It's not supernatural enough, not miraculous sounding enough. Unto the Greeks foolishness. It didn't require uh, the intellect to embrace it, to grab a hold of it. Verse 24. But unto them which are called, that's another term for the saved. That's another term for the bride of Christ, the called. But unto them which are called, uh, uh, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, that's to satisfy the Jew, uh, and the wisdom of God, that's to satisfy the Greek. Paul identifies three groups later on in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in chapter 10, verse 32, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Everyone falls into one of those three categories. You're either an unbelieving Jew who uh, does not know Jesus Christ, or you're an unbelieving Gentile who does not know Jesus Christ. Uh, or you're in a third group made up of saved Jews and Gentiles, which constitute the church, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we say the church, we don't always mean a local church. The church primarily means a universal body of all believers around the world. No matter where they live, what language they speak, what level of education they have, what their experiences have been, if they have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and, the for, and God as the forgiver of their sins, they are part of the bride of Christ, they are part of the body of Christ, and whether you like it or not, uh, or you agree with them or not, they and you are joined together as part of the bride and the body of Christ, as part of the church. Now turn, if you will, to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, and notice there, verse 18. We read, There is no fear in love, <clears throat> excuse me, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. If you're afraid that God doesn't love you anymore, or if you're afraid that it's not permanent, uh, and, you can, and you're doubting it all the time, you know what? That's going to bring you spiritual torment for the rest of your life. But perfect love casteth out fear. And I have no fear that my wife doesn't love me. I know she does. And she knows I love her. And so should that confidence be between you and the Heavenly Father, by, excuse me, by the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, people who are uh, tortured with fear, whether God still loves them after they've done something stupid, 
they've done something unchristian-like, uh, unholy, uh, contrary to the will of the Lord Jesus. You know, am I really saved? Can I possibly lose it? Is there something more I need to hang on to it? And then verse 19 here in 1 John 4 says, We love him because he first loved us. The song says, There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. So I call this outline, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Oh, How I Love Jesus. <clears throat> It'll be simple. But uh, point number one, uh, why do I love Jesus? <clears throat> and you're, you can probably think of the response after I say, Oh, how I love Jesus. You can probably think of the first point because the song has it. Because he first loved me. Yes. That's why I love him. The Bible says, <clears throat> He that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, verse 24. Christ said, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Paul added, that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. God loved me before I ever loved him. And he loved you then before you ever loved him. He demonstrated that love when he sent the Lord Jesus into this world to die on the cross of Calvary as a substitute for you, as a sacrifice for you, uh, to bear the judgment that your sins deserved, to bear the punishment that you had earned for sinning against a holy God. And uh, <clears throat> that is how his love was demonstrated. Uh, people think, so, will sometimes say, uh, the love of God, or they talk about God's love in some sort of a nebulous, indefined, uh, undefined uh, form. <clears throat> it just sort of floats out there, but that's not really scriptural. God's love was deposited on the cross of Calvary when the Lord Jesus died as a substitute for you and for me. That's where God's love is placed. And if you want to know the love of God, then by faith, all you can do is by faith, go there and receive it. And a great transaction will take place between you and the Savior. His death covers your guilt, and your guilt and sins are put upon him, and uh, you go from sinner to saint that quickly. What a marvelous thing. It's hard to believe. It's one of those kinds of things you don't fully understand <clears throat> when it happens to you. Uh, it takes years to wrap your mind around what God did for you, what it all means to you. And yet, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful blessing. Uh, I was six years old when I got saved. All I knew is that I was a sinner and I, I didn't want to go to hell. I was crying and uh, begging God to forgive me. But over my lifetime, I have learned more and more about what he has done for me, how he's loved me, and uh, why wouldn't I love him in return? But uh, God had no guarantee that you would love him in return. But um, when you realized what what salvation includes to you, why wouldn't you love him? I love him because 
he first loved me. He set aside his throne in glory. We sing, out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. He suffered at the hands of wicked men. He said to the, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He endured mockery by those who were jealous of him. Uh, Matthew 25, 18 says, Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered Christ to be crucified. He was lied about and slandered. The chief priests um, sought false witnesses, and then later it says they suborned men who would lie against the testimony of Stephen, Acts chapter 6. He was rejected by his own family. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and among his own people. He was abandoned by his closest followers. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, the Bible says. He was scourged and crucified um, on your behalf, for your sake, for your sins, for the wickedness that you are guilty of. As of a lamb, without spot and without blemish. You know, your deepest affection, your, your deepest uh, devotion for anything in the universe should be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the idea of Jesus Christ. Not some concept, but to Him. Your deepest affections and devotion should be towards Him. I love Him because He first loved me and purchased my salvation on Calvary's tree, the song says. So I love Jesus because He first loved me. When someone does something good for you, you can't help but sense a, 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 a bit of a measure of um, obligation and duty uh, in, in response to them. And the greater the gift is to you, the greater the responsibility you have to them, if at all possible. Because uh, you can't pay back what God did for you. You can't pay back what the, the value of Christ's death is for you. So you have to complete, completely surrender yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the will of God. That's the only way you're going to get through uh, life and then into eternity when this life is over. But I love him, first of all, because he first loved me. Uh, point number two today is, how do I love Jesus? By obeying his words. This is how I demonstrate my love for him, by obeying his words, by keeping his commandments, by doing what he asks me to do. A boy or a girl show their love for their father, their mother, by doing what they're told, what they're asked to do. No questions asked. Well, it may be difficult, but they might grumble under their breath. But... Uh, by, they show they, that they love their father and mother by doing what dad and mom ask them to do. You know, a kid is not in charge. Um, I've been watching a lot of reruns of old uh, Andy Griffith show. I got a lot of extra time at home. And there's one episode where little uh, Opie has a friend who's trying to tell him you know, you should throw a temper tantrum, get more allowance from your father, and so forth. And the kid says to Opie, i never known a kid yet who can win in a man-to-man -man fight. <laughs> well, that's very true. Uh, in life, the parents are in charge, not the children. But that's why the Bible says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First Thessalonians 5.18 You're to give thanks for everything that comes your way. 
the good, the bad, the pleasant, the unpleasant. The, even the, the giving of thanks is a commandment. God the Father said, uh, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. Point, this is point number one. And keep my commandments. That's point number two. Exodus 20, verse 6. And um, your mother, your father, they expect you to mind. They expect you to obey. They expect you to do what you're told and taught to do without murmuring or complaining. This is the way life is. Christ said the same thing. If ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. That might not be pleasant. And that might not be enjoyable. It might humble you, but you're told in a number of places, humble yourselves for one reason or another. Christ said, love your enemies. That's a commandment. Not simply a recommendation. He said, bless them that curse you. That's a commandment. Can you do that? He said, do good to them that hate you. That's a commandment. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's a commandment. Matthew 5, 44. And uh, others just like it. Those are just a few. Excuse me. Paul emphasized much the same thing. Romans chapter 12, uh, certain verses. Let love be without dissimulation. That's to pretend that you love them <clears throat> because you have some ulterior motive behind it. Abhor that which is evil. It's amazing how interesting uh, wicked things and worldly things and carnal things uh, uh, Christians find in this life. They're interested in it. They want to hear it. They want to watch it. They want to look at it. They want to know about it. They want to talk about it. They want to consider it and spend their hours dwelling on it. And it's of no profit to them spiritually. Paul said, be kindly affectioned one toward another. That's very difficult to do. One toward another. That's a commandment. He said, in honor, preferring one another. Can you put the other person first? Sometimes. Can you say, no, I can wait till later. I want you to do this first. Give someone else the advantage. He says, not slothful in business. God wants Christians to be uh, industrious, hardworking, diligent. He says, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. They call that alacrity and celerity, quickness, readiness to do what's asked of you. The telephone rings and you're quick to answer it because you're not lazy. You're not dragging your feet. And uh, fervent in spirit, quick to serve the Lord, ready and willing to do something for the honor of God and the honor of Jesus Christ. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Not the great tribulation. You're not looking forward to that. But when you have difficulties and trials and things that wear down on you, you're to be patient with them. You're to be patient. You heard about the guy that said, prayed, God, give me patience and hurry. Um, continuing instant in prayer. That's a commandment. Continuing instant in prayer. The first thing you should do when you have a, a problem uh, enter your life, come, come to you. The first thing you should do 
is take it to God. Take it to God in prayer. You read about some great Christians in the past, men and women, and they were so close to the Lord in prayer. Uh, they're like on a they're, they're on a different level than you have ever been, or ever have thought of being. The first thing they would ever do is pray, and talk to the Lord about their issues, their needs. And that's how you and I are to be continuing instant in prayer. He says, "Bless them which." persecute you, bless, and curse not. That's a commandment. Bless them that persecute you, and bless and curse not. Verse 18, Romans 12, 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That's a commandment. Verse 20 there says, Therefore, if an enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. You may bring conviction to them that they weren't expecting to have, and uh, only God could do it. You, you respond to their... Uh, and then verse 21 there says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You kill their their anger with kindness. Kill it with kindness. And nobody wants to do that. It's more fun to, we think it's more fun to, you know, take a little revenge and get back at somebody. That's not scriptural. I love Jesus because he first loved me. And secondly, I show my love for him by keeping his commandments. Now, I'm so happy that we're not living under the Mosaic Law, where commandments included animal sacrifices and uh, keeping certain uh, days on the calendar and cutting our hair and shaving our beards a certain way. Um, but, but to respond to God out of love and obedience as men and women who have been redeemed and saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our duty to God now uh, is more spiritual in, internal in its nature and our response to him. I love Jesus by keeping his commandments. And lastly, let me say this. I love Jesus by loving the brethren. I demonstrate my love for Jesus when I love the brethren. The word of God says, but he that is uh, joined unto the Lord is one spirit. First Corinthians 6, verse 17. Have you ever had somebody uh, on your mind, a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ? Has there ever been one of those people on your mind you haven't spoken to them in a while? You don't know why you're thinking of them so much that day. But just when you weren't expecting it, they call you. I have. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. We were in uh, Pensacola years ago, and one Saturday, the two of our kids were real small, we decided to drive north <clears throat> into Atmore, Alabama. Atmore, Alabama. I don't know how big that little town is. Um, only several hundred. But they were having a, a, a train, a train show. Uh, a couple of old locomotives were going to be coming through. And then a modern Amtrak uh, train car. And a bunch of train enthusiasts, train hobbyists. And... Uh, we were, so we drove out to the country, um, pulled into the parking lot. We were talking about my brother-in-law, who's very cerebral, sort of a brainiac. And uh, my wife and I were thinking, who in the world could ever talk to him about the Lord? And my friend, 
Um, Bob Gendler, a Jewish friend who my dad, my dad led to the Lord one Wednesday night here back in the oh, 70s, 80s. Uh, and uh, I said, Robert Gendler could talk to him because uh, they would speak the same language when it came to um, intellect and intellectual reasons. We parked our car, got out of the car, and the first thing we decided to do was get something to eat. So we got in line, got some hot dogs. I think we're sitting on a public sidewalk. And uh, I looked up, looked down the sidewalk, and I saw this fellow walking. And I could tell by his gait that was Bob Gindler. He walked right in front of me, and I said, Bob Gindler. He was surprised to see me as I was to see him. I said, I uttered your name not even five minutes ago, and here you are. Turns out he was in the Air Force. His wife and one little boy were down in that area, and they came to the town for the same reason we had, just to you know, get some recreation, get out of the house. And uh, we had good fellowship, good visit. And like I say, it, that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Um, you and I are knit together uh, in an unbreakable bond in the body of Jesus Christ. Collectively, all true believers make up the body of Jesus Christ. The true church, the bride of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, the called. That's another term for the saints, the called, the saints, the beloved. If believers, and I was, I was thinking of this this morning, I don't want to say it wrongly. If believers could somehow shut out the world more and devote their attentions to the Lord Jesus Christ more, spend more time dwelling and meditating on his words, what they read in the Bible, spending more time in prayer, more and more time in prayer and in reading the scriptures and seeking to know the Bible and to fulfill what they see and to live up to their lives as Christians toward other Christians. If believers could close out the world and spend more attention, give more attention to the things of God and Jesus Christ, then perhaps our, our union with one another would manifest itself more often. I like having fellowship with you. I like sensing that you and I are joined together. I like the, 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 the uh, feeling that you and I are on the same team. We're working toward the same goal. We're working to get, to, we, we're living to get to the same place by trusting the same blood uh, of the same Savior. And uh, we anticipate any day now to be called up, called up, uh, come up hither. And uh, what a wonderful day it's going to be. Uh, when my Jesus I shall see, as the song said. But um, the Bible says, Herein is our love made perfect. That is, it's thorough, it's complete, it doesn't require anything more. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, in the day of judgment because as he is, 
so are we in this world. That's 1 John 4, verse 17. I think we may have read that earlier, but later we read, by this, we know that we love the children of God. That's point number three. When we uh, love God, point number one, and keep his commandments, point number two. See how that verse there, um, that's uh, all 1 John 5, verse uh, 2. Those three, one falls in line, so sort of like dominoes, one follows the other in a logical uh, format. For this is the love of God, that is not his love towards you, but your love towards him. This is the love of God, your love of him, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, verse 3. God's not going to ask you to do something that you can't fulfill. Oh, how I love Jesus. I love him because he first loved me. I love him by keeping his words. I love him by loving the brethren. Bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. I can't tell you what a blessing that verse has been to me the last few months. And uh, I've texted it to people who contact me and say, I'm praying for you and we want God's best for you. And the brethren's kindness has been overwhelming. Um, by this... Shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another? John 13, verse 35. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Believers. Galatians 6, verse 10. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. Those who love the brethren, those who love one another, are born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 1 John 4, verse 7. So this is a uh, simple three-point outline. Let me bring this to a close right now. Oh, how I love Jesus by, because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus by keeping his commandments, by his words. Uh, oh, how I love Jesus by loving the brethren. When, when, uh, when you are identified with the Lord Jesus Christ, then... By, by me loving you, I am showing my love for the Lord Jesus indirectly. And that's the way God planned it. That's the way God wants it. And uh, we thank the Lord for it. Okay, let's pray and we'll conclude for today. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would dismiss us with this, with these uh, uh, understanding. And uh, these comments, we pray that you would knit us together in a closer body of believers. We thank you for the fellowship we enjoy. We thank you for those things which draw us together by the same Savior, the same blood, the same forgiveness, the same hope, the same eternity. And we ask, Lord, that uh, until the day we hear the words, come up hither, we would be closer drawn to one another, Lord, and seek to please you with all that we have and possess. We ask this now in the Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen.